By the 1850s, a decade before the Civil War, slavery caused harsh disagreements among the northern and the southern states, and even within families. In New York, where slavery had been outlawed since July 4, 1827, and where many New Yorkers were active abolitionists, there were also divided loyalties on the slavery question as the banking and shipping industries maintained strong commercial ties to the cotton and sugar trading interests that originated in the South and in the Caribbean. The Lemon case presented a direct conflict between slaveholders and New York abolitionists. In 1852, Juliet and Jonathan Lemon, residents of the slave state of Virginia, decided to move to Texas, another slave state. For the first leg of their journey, the Lemons traveled on a ship named the City of Richmond from Norfolk, Virginia to New York City, where they disembarked and waited in a hotel for another ship to take them to Texas. In addition to all their worldly possessions and their seven children, the Lemons brought with them eight slaves. Emmeline, who at 23 was the head of her family, which consisted of her 16-year-old brother, Louis, her 13-year-old brother, Edward, and her two-year-old daughter, Amanda, and Nancy, who was 22, and the head of her family, which consisted of her twin seven-year-old sons, Louis and Edward, and her five-year-old daughter, Anne. Nancy's husband, the father of Anne, was himself a slave. The Lemons Group, 17 people and all their possessions, arrived in New York on Friday, November 5, 1852. Louis Napoleon, a free black man and a New Yorker very active in the abolitionist movement, had learned from a steward who worked on the city of Richmond that these eight slaves had been secretly brought into New York and were being held in a small overcrowded hotel room. The following day, Louis Napoleon, unable to read or write, but keenly educated as to how to use the New York courts to help free slaves, dictated a writ of habeas corpus to the clerk of the Superior Court, marked an X on the writ as his signature, and commenced a court action which sought to free the Lemon slaves. Through his extensive connections with the New York abolitionist movement, Louis Napoleon made sure that the Lemon slaves were represented by a first-rate legal team, which included John Jay, a grandson of the founder by the same name, and Chester A. Arthur, who went on to become the 21st President of the United States. The case was heard before Judge Elijah Payne. On the strength of Louis Napoleon's initial papers, Judge Payne ordered the slaves brought to the courthouse and after a short delay to allow the Lemons to hire a lawyer, Judge Payne heard arguments from counsel and ruled that all eight slaves should be free. The Lemons argued that under the laws of Virginia and the United States Constitution, they held proper title to the slaves as their property, and no court could take away their property rights, although courts had ruled that way before. Judge Payne's ruling, controversial at the time, were based on two principles. First, Judge Payne found that because the Lemons had voluntarily brought the slaves into New York, a state that had outlawed slavery 25 years earlier, the slaves were emancipated under New York law and were now free. Of greater historical importance, however, Judge Payne ruled the slaves free based on a higher moral authority. Beyond New York law, Judge Payne wrote, by the law of nature, no one can have a property in slaves. While the Lemons appealed from Judge Payne's decision, the abolitionists involved in the case secured prompt passage for the now freed slaves to move north from safe house to safe house, the so-called Underground Railroad, which was well established in New York State. They ultimately resettled in Canada, where they could be safe from any appeal taken by the Lemons. Judge Payne's ruling in the Lemon case was extremely controversial at the time. Northern abolitionists pointed to it as a just decision, while some slaveholders in the South cited the ruling as an important reason why the Southern states should secede from the Union complaining that northern courts were not adequately protecting their property rights. 
appeals were taken all the way to the highest court in New York. Nonetheless, in every appeal, Judge Payne's decision to free the slaves was upheld. The Lemons ultimately tried to take their appeal to the Supreme Court of the United States. But by then, the Civil War broke out, and the Lemons could not appeal further, because Virginia had seceded from the Union. Interestingly, since under the laws of Virginia, the eight slaves were considered property held by the Lemons, and since the court ruling had the effect of taking slaves away from the Lemons, New Yorkers involved in the case, and other abolitionists voluntarily raised a fund of $5,000, valued at over $100,000 today, to compensate the Lemons for the economic loss they suffered by bringing their slaves to New York. In return, the Lemons agreed that no matter how any higher court ruled on appeal, they would no longer contest the right of their former slaves to live free. Judge Payne himself contributed $100 to the fund. By paying this money to the Lemons, the abolitionists ensured that the former Lemons slaves would never again have to be concerned that a ruling by a court would return them to slavery. <laughs>